This program is brought to you by Emory University. I am going to do quick bios of our three panelists, and then I'm going to turn this over to them as they are the experts on the topic. First of all, uh, to my immediate left is Naomi Tsu. Naomi is a senior staff, attor staff attorney with the Immigrant Justice Project of the Southern Poverty Law Center, where she litigates and advocates for immigrants in the Deep South on employment rights and civil rights matters. Ms. Tsu represents clients who have experienced wage theft, discrimination, human trafficking, and other harms confronting migrant workers. She also litigates challenges to state anti-immigrant laws and policies, and she advocates at the federal and regional levels on behalf of immigrants' civil and workplace rights. Prior to joining SPLC, she clerked for the Honorable Betty B. Fletcher of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and graduated from the University of California <laughs> at Berkeley. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> to Naomi's left, Rebecca Miller is a staff attorney at the DeKalb County Office of the Atlanta Legal Aid Society. She previously worked for 10 years at the Farm Worker Rights Division of Georgia Legal Services, representing both U.S. workers and foreign guest workers in federal employment litigation. She clerked for Judge Consuelo Marshall in the Central District of California and for Judge Beverly Martin on the 11th Circuit. Ms. Miller is a graduate of NYU Law School where she was a Root Tilden Scholar. And to her left, Shannon Stevenson is a partner in the Atlanta office of Fisher and Phillips. A graduate of Georgia State University College of Law, Ms. Stevenson has over 15 years of experience in advising employers on recruiting and hiring immigrant employees. She has comprehensive knowledge and extensive experience in a broad range of immigration areas, including advising clients on current immigration legislation, handling non-immigrant and immigrant visa applications, outbound visas, export administration regulation deemed export determinations, and advising employers on I-9 compliance. So we have a wealth of expertise with us, and I will let the experts talk. Thank you all so much for coming, and thank you all for being here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so um, we have sort of a small group, and we really have discussed, we really want you to encourage you all to speak up and offer your experiences or questions at any time during, what, um, during our discussion today. Um, and. Um, because I think that the issue that we're talking about is something where there's not a whole lot of bright line rules. There's, uh, it's very fact specific and determinative. And I know from my experience, it's things that you're, issues that you're considering throughout the life of a case. Every case is different, every client is different, every situation is different, and, every, and the answer is different <laughs> in every situation. Um, so to the extent that um, you'd like to offer some of your experiences, we'd be happy to in include that and really enrich our discussion. I think what we're gonna talk about is um, the ethical issues that come up in representing undocumented clients, um, undocumented workers, and then um, Shannon also is, can offer sometimes um, her perspective from representing employers where there are undocumented workers at issue or immigration um, obligations for employers. Um, we're gonna talk about it sort of from a general sense about what is the model rule, what are the ethical obligations that are sort of on paper, how that comes up, how that comes up in uh, um, how that com comes up practically and in real life. I think sometimes I feel like the model rules are an interesting starting point for a discussion, but how they come to life in actual practice um, sometimes is very, very different when you're just uh, looking at it from an academic perspective of a rule on a piece of paper. Um, and then we are going to talk a little bit about um, ad, uh, your. Uh, in, during your um, representation of someone, your advice to them, your, the decision making and choices that you have to um, undergo, and um, strategies and tools, the litigation and strategy tools that um, are available under the federal rules and under the case law to um, protect your clients and um, f sort of further their interests in the litigation despite any immigration issues that might exist. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, so here's the um, the model rule. There's an article. Did anybody read the article that's in the book? We were just it's in the book today. So there's an article that's in the materials that you got that talks about the model rule and some hypotheticals about would that come up. And we're not going to talk too much about it today. It's something that you can look at later. But it um, 
it starts out talking about this issue of um, the sort of the crime fraud rule, which I think we all remember from law school and discussed about what your obligations are when something's going on. So the rule is about um, a lawyer's obligation when, um, when there is p potentially some criminal conduct at issue with their client and um, what their ethical obligations are in terms of the article also discusses, discusses disclosure, but um, in terms of your contact, your representation of them, your advice to them. And I think the, the couple things that um, pop out for me in this rule is, um, particularly when representing Im um, immigrant clients, is first of all, is there a crime? I think that with immigration issues, there's a lot of issues that are actually civil and administrative uh, violations versus criminal violations. Um, so that's one thing that's important to understand. And then there's also the issue of, is it a continuing violation? Because if there's not a continuing violation, you're also not going to run afoul of this rule. Um, and then is your conduct, your representation, your advice somehow assisting in the criminal conduct at issue? So those are sort of the three questions that I think kind of come up with this rule. And um, the article and, he, and I th um, talks about, sort of reaches the conclusion, which I think Naomi and I discussed from our own perspective, perspective and practice that there's very rarely actually an, uh, an instance where it comes up that the model rule prevents you from representing an undocumented worker zealously in um, immigration in a employment or labor setting. There are decisions that you make about how you uh, what claims you might select, how you might proceed in discovery and trial, and we'll talk about those later. But the ability to represent someone and enforce the rights that they have under federal statutes and state statutes um, is very rarely impinged upon by this model rule. Um, does anybody else want to add anything? Um, so, so let's let's put a little flesh on those bones. Someone comes to you. They have, say, a labor and employment problem, and you're asking yourself, can I ethically represent this person? Um, am I assisting them in, in committing a crime such that I'm in violation of, the, of Rule 1.2D? Um, some things that you probably want to know about are uh, what it is that, that might put you at risk. As Rebecca says, it's very rare for anybody to be brought up on um, bar charges under this rule. I've never heard of it, actually. Has anybody heard of anybody being brought up on bar charges for representing an undocumented person? I don't even know any. I've asked some people, and nobody had ever heard of it. So, so rest assured, it's, it's um, as a practical matter, not likely. But also as a theoretical matter, it's not likely um, for various reasons. For one thing, undocumented people are probably to be undocumented in this country is not a crime. People probably know that. It's um, an administrative violation, but it's not actually a crime. Um, about 40% of undocumented people here in this country uh, overstayed their visa, entered legally, and then stayed too long. So they never committed a crime. Um, other people came across without inspection, entered illegally, and committed a crime in the process of doing so, admitting um, coming across the border um, without inspection, uh, 8 U.S.C. 1325 is a misdemeanor. It has a statute of limitations like all misdemeanors, and that crime is complete upon entry. And so the fact that somebody is present without papers gives you no clue as to whether or not they are still, eligible, still vulnerable to prosecution under this rule. Um, if they, it's a, and so it's not, again, you're not helping them to complete a crime. The crime, any crime in the past has been completed, just as if I sped on my way to get here and then went to a lawyer's office for a different matter. I have completed a crime, but they are not helping me to complete it. Um, 8 U.S.C. 1326, which is reentry after removal, is a felony, and it can be in some step in some circuits. It's considered a continuing violation. Um, but again, even there, which I think is the situation where there's the most, the strongest argument that one is helping someone to commit a crime because it's in some jurisdictions a continuing violation. Even there, one has to think about one's intent. Is one 
helping this person, let's say they came in, they weren't paid, they didn't get their last paycheck. Uh, am I representing them because I want to help that person stay in the country? If so, I should think about model rule that 1.2D, um, there's at least an argument that I'm in violation. I should also think about 8 U.S.C. 1324 harboring, which is a federal felony, um, which turns on whether you're intending to help someone stay in the country illegally. Um, but usually, that, that intent will not be present. If I am, rather than intending to aid someone's presence, rather seeking to vindicate their employment rights and ha help them to receive compensation to which they are entitled for work that they performed, I am not furthering a crime. Um, other issues that people should know about, failure to depart, knowing use of forged or false documents. Um, these are things about which you can counsel clients and I um, encourage people to dig deeper, talk to immigration attorneys to understand this better if you're, if you're seeing a lot of undocumented people, but it's a matter of counseling your clients if, you, um, if it comes up so they understand what risk they are at, but it is not um, a risk that you, that you are under in terms of um, your ethical obligations. Just, um, yeah, others. And, yeah. And, I, and I just want to add, it's, um, you know, we're sort of looking at this again from an academic perspective, but when an undocumented person comes into your office seeking services, I mean, you're not like, you know, doing a like examination of their background and looking for this conduct. And so it would be, it's more likely to come up when it's intertwined with whatever their representation issue is, or there's something where, or they've asked you for information about what the legal standard are. Like Naomi said, you know, we have our, ob our legal obligation to give people accurate information about what the implications are but there's no obligation to like go through people's history and understand how they came here when what they're actually coming about is to get their last paycheck or help with a discrimination issue um, only to the extent that it's relative just like you wouldn't do for any other client find out if they are you know stealing cars on the side in addition <laughs> oh and if i could just say one more thing which is something that rebecca um pointed out to me earlier it uh it is that one of the reasons why uh, why people um, this 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 issue of whether or not um, there's access to legal representation, it um, there's a policy point behind it, which is that if undocumented people can't get access to lawyers um, to vindicate workplace rights, then it creates a perverse incentive to hire undocumented people. Um, and so we'll get into this more later about how the coverage of f federal and state um, uh, labor employment laws, but just that policy perspective is one thing that's in the background. And you said a couple of things I can't remember. So. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, yeah, I think also the article sort of uh, talks a little bit too about, you know, possible future, there's a lot of legislative proposals going on right now about immigration issues that we all know. And some of them would make it a little bit more complicated in representing someone who's undocumented, but they've often not been successful. Um, and one of the reasons is sort of the practical limitations of how you would enforce them and the issue where a lot of times when courts are finding people protected and just regardless of their immigration status under a federal law, they're doing so because of the broader public interest in them having that goal. And so the more... Um, although politicians like to talk tough about having these really strict rules, when it comes down to it, it there's a public good issue at, at the same time. And so I know in Georgia, for example, there was an issue about making it illegal to be helping undocumented people and having them in your car or any, any kind of thing. And it didn't pass because of it not only it's because of the sort of broad implications of that and also the public interest behind it, n um, not necessarily because people were um, out there <laughs> championing the rights of undocumented people, but the um, church and all kinds of groups that that could, that, that could affect. In looking at the possible criminal or, or civil penalties that employers can face when dealing with undocumented <laughs> workers, we really have to start with their I-9 obligations. They have an obligation to verify the identity and the employment authorization of anyone that they hire um, after the date of November 6, 1986. And the, the I-9 form, if anybody's ever taken a look at it, is deceptively simple. It used to be a one-page form. It's recently changed to a two-page form. 
but now there's a 67 page handbook for employers on how to complete those two pages <laughs> um, and you know on a daily basis we get calls from our clients saying the situation I have in front of me is not in the 67 page handbook how do I complete this I-9 so it's very deceptive and there's very few employers who are completing the I-9 form correctly which is why there's so many um, high fines in this area because there are so many employers that are not completing it correctly. And for even just substantive um, violations or technical violations where you didn't ask for the correct documents or you didn't write down the correct dates, those fines can range anywhere from $110 to $1,100 per I-9 form. So when you think about an employer and how many employees they have and multiply that, that's a huge fine. Um, and some of these fines have been in the millions for some employers just on, on technical and administrative violations. Where you get into the more serious issues is when there is knowing n evidence of the employer knowing that they're continuing to employ somebody who's not authorized to work here. And for the civil fines for a first violation, it can be anywhere from $375 to $3,200. And for subsequent violations, all the way up to $16,000 per violation. So you can see that those fines really add up quickly. And it's a very difficult area for employers in terms of compliance and also with the increased government workforce investigations that have been going on. There's been a lot more raids. There's been a lot more internal uh, I-9 audits by the government and Immigration Customs Enforcement. So this is definitely an area where the government is looking at employers closely. Um, and in fact, I think last year the budget um, exceeded the budget for the FBI, the CIA, and, and the Drug Enforcement Agency. So you can see how serious the government is about making sure that our employers are complying with the law. Um, then you can get into areas where there's criminal penalties for employers, and these are very high and severe as well. You can have up to 10 years and $250,000 fine for something as simple as harboring. And I say simple because um, there have been cases where if a warehouse is raided and the HR director opens the back door and lets all the employees out, that's evidence of harboring. Um, so it can be something very simple and something that's somebody decides on a very split second decision that could really change their life forever. And also other things that have um, led to incidents of harboring is for instance, if you're in the agricultural um, business and you have a DOL inspect, uh, somebody from the Department of Labor coming to do an inspection that day and somebody from the company tells the employees to run and hide in the bushes while DOL's there. That's another um, incident where it could lead to criminal penalties and those are very high. Before we move on, I just wanted to point out Naomi reminded me that the Georgia harboring statute did pass, but it was enjoined permanently by the court. So there is. So let's talk about some situations and um, the, the coverage of the laws. Nearly without exception, labor employment laws protect everyone without regard to immigration status. Title VII, the Fair Labor Standards Act, so your right to minimum pay, minimum wages, overtime, um, the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, the Equal Pay Act, um, and then civil rights statutes, 42 U.S.C., 1981, 1983, 1985. These all cover without regard to immigration status. They ter talk in terms of people, not citizens. Um, and they are, uh, and the, so on the f reading of the statutes, they apply broadly. And then the application of the case law, you'll see that, that there is this application regardless of whether one is undocumented, a guest worker, a legal permanent resident, a citizen. It's, the question there is, are you a worker? Was there work performed? And were there other s substantive violations of the merits? Um, the same is true of breach of contract and torts. Workers' compensation is mixed. Many, many states say that undocumented workers are covered by the workers' compensation system for the same reason that work, the workers' compensation system exists at all, which is that if the employer does not, is not covered by a workers' comp, then they're liable under tort, which um, means, could mean much higher penalties. And so when faced with it, 
state courts often say that undocumented workers are covered, even in um, relatively conservative states. It's just a, a, um, the reasons that underlie the workers' comp system apply without regard to um, immigration status, typically. Unemployment insurance is not available because you have to be work authorized in order to get workers' um, unemployment insurance. One thing to keep in mind, though, is the idea that remedies are limited. So the courts have been clear and consistent that liability um, or protections attach uh, no matter what your status is, but uh, the range of remedies can vary. So in this case, Hoffman Plastics, um, it was a question of whether an undocumented worker was entitled to compensations under the National Labor Relations Act, um, and the Supreme Court said that he was not entitled to reinstatement and back pay because he wasn't work authorized. And um, courts since then have been struggling to implement that and typically have decided that um, that there is, it's very clear that people are entitled to um, compensation for pay for work performed um, or for, to discrimination while working at the company um, or to um, they, that undocumented people need coverage under the ADA and so forth. So while you're at the company, any harms that you suffer while there is compensable, including emotional distress. When you're talking about future coverage, so reinstatement, front pay, the kind of, um, the kind of thing that looks at what happens after you left the company, courts are much more split. Um, some have, many have held that those kinds of future um, looking remedies are not available to undocumented people because they're not work authorized, so can't, for example, be reinstated to a job that they're not entitled to perform. Others have held that Hoffman Plastics is limited to only the NLRA and so doesn't cover, say, Title VII. And so the case law there is more mixed, and I encourage you to look in your particular jurisdiction. Um, but if we, for the purposes of this discussion, let's take a more conservative view um, and say that, say that we're in a place where the remedies only cover work performed or, or harms done while at the company. One of the things that, as a practice pointer that Rebecca and I have, have struggled with is how do you then frame your lawsuit in a way that um, allows you to clear out some obstacles down the way, down the way, and we'll get more into this, but um, remedies that might come into play are, do, do you ask for front pay? knowing that your, your client may well not be entitled to it and it will raise all sorts of issues of immigration status? Do you ask for emotional damages that arise after the person left the company? Um, do you ask for return travel expenses for, for guest workers? These are things that um, go case by case, but there's some things that we wanted to flag for you. And one of the reasons why we think about it is because um, discovery of immigration status can be really um, challenging for plaintiffs and their, and their um, families and coworkers and so forth. Some plaintiffs would rather not bring a suit at all, even if they're clearly owed money, because they're afraid of being deported. And so there's this chilling effect that can, where they'll say, you know what, I, I didn't get my last few paychecks, but I don't care because I'm scared of being deported. And if it's going to come up, I don't want to do this. Or um, there are, I think, 7 million people living in this country who are part of mixed status ha um, households. And so one person might have status be an, a legal permanent resident or a citizen, and another person in that household is undocumented. And so there's also a fear of, say, you have emotional distress claims. That means that maybe my wife is going to be deposed. My wife doesn't have immigration status. Is she going to be deported? I'm not going to do anything that's risk going to risk her. Um, there are questions about uh, misuse of this information. It, hopefully this doesn't come up for any of you in your practices, but it has happened where some um, litigants have sought to use immigration status to say you can't trust this person. They they broke the laws in coming into this country. They have credibility issues, um, and 
and if you're in a place where immigration and the immigration debate is inflamed, that's a concern for the jury pool. So there are risks with immigration status discovery, which we'll spend some time on, but that's one of the reasons that we flag these, these remedies and these issues for you guys. Um, so we're going to sort of zero in on some of the things a little more specifically. So um, you're, you have someone who's undocumented and comes to your office and they have an employment issue and you're sort of talking it through with them um, and to helping them understand what their options are, what the risks are, if they are going to proceed with a lawsuit, and what the legal protections are too. And I always like... Um, <coughs> want to think think about it too from there are sometimes there are great protections on paper but it's also you want to give people clear information not only what the actual language of the statute is and how it should work and should be enforced but from your experience what happened too because we can say like oh it's retaliatory if the employer calls ICE and reports you because they do it because their their um, motive is because you've sued them well it might be illegal, but if it happens, the way that spins out and the effect on your personal life is something that you have to deal with. And the courts, we all know, are not always rapid and uh, sympathetic and jumping in to just fix things and um, put things, put people's lives back together. And so you want to make sure that your clients are understanding um, the legal protections, but then sort of the practical way that that could unfold so they can make an informed decision about why, why if th that they want to do something to enforce their rights. At the same time, I always don't, I don't want to I never want to sort of create this fearful situation where we just have the people sitting in the shadows and never, um, never feeling comfortable to um, enforce the rights that they do have, um, especially something like a workplace right that it's very clearly established. Um, and I think that we have an obligation, and I think there was a discussion earlier today about you know criminal lawyers helping people who have um, immigration issues. You might be helping someone with what seems like a clear-cut um, employment issue, but if you are representing immigrant workers, you have an obligation as attorney to be helping think out like a chess game some of the other implications and make sure you're counseling them and protecting them um, in that in that regard um, so some of the risks that come up and questions you might get from clients but also things um, to talk about are having to reveal your status in discovery or at trial and um, there uh, um, there's the um, there's ways that, like we said before, that you can try and avoid that, but it is something that potentially comes um, can come up, and um, even when you're able to get a protective order or a motion in limine that status shouldn't be discussed, discovery shouldn't go into status, sometimes em uh, employers... Um, uh, attorneys are very good at just suggesting other facts that will help will make a jury think oh this person is undocumented and try and sort of benefit from that um, suggestive inference um, another thing that people ask about and that's concerned is like the logistics of um, participation um, there's if you're undocumented it's difficult to move around the country I represented guest workers a lot who um, were in and out of the country as well so if I'm if I'm undocumented or if I'm sometimes in the US and sometimes back in Mexico you know can I um, how does that affect my ability to go forward with a lawsuit um, and so that's that's another thing the location of deposition having to return for trial um, and if someone is undocumented and working outside of the forum are they going to be able to get back to, to, to participate in those ways and so thinking about those issues um, then there's retaliation issues um, so we talked a little bit about the limit on uh, remedies so and I always get a little thrown off by the front pay back pay kind of lingo but it's like if you're if you're if you're that you're entitled to um, compensation for harms that happen when you're actually working and then you're fired um, if you have, have a retaliation claim and I might be speaking to people who already know all these things right but if um, you can prove later that you were illegally retaliated against you can get lost wages for the time that you would have been working but for the retaliation right but if you're undocumented and you're not work authorized and you get fired because of your lawsuit you might not have that remedy available to you and so making sure that um, someone uh, who making if they're still working for an employer and they are thinking about bringing things understand the limitation on their remedy for retaliation if you're representing someone who's a US client you can talk 
you know, much more like, well, if they if they try and fire you, I'll say that's retaliation and I'll add another claim in and we'll be really angry and we'll go to the judge and complain about it. And you don't have uh, some some of the same types of um, uh, tools available in that situation. And then there's just the other um, issues about retaliatory reporting to ICE and police. Luckily, like a lot that doesn't happen as much as it does happen, but it doesn't. I think that some of those things don't happen as much. And courts have been pretty supportive um, about um, stepping in on that. And I think it also depends on communication with the local ICE office and if they're um, what if they're aware of what's going on and things like that. But that again, it's one of those reality the what's on the books and what should be permissible. Um, versus the effect that it has on someone if they have to go through that sort of scary experience or if they are just in fear of that because they have a particular vindictive employer who's threatening that and, um, you know, they have those concerns. Uh, um, so just to, to build on that, um, it's, um, as, you all, as you all may know, representing somebody in U.S. courts, they don't actually have to be in the United States um, and there are good materials out there that talk about how does one, in fact, represent somebody. Let's say your client is in Mexico. Um, it takes care of some of these problems about fear of deportation, fear of retaliation, or it can at least, depending on whether they're seeking to be rehired for another season and so forth. Um, most people do that. They will have a bad experience, but say, if they'll only do what they're supposed to do, I would like to come back. And so there's this question of um, failure to rehire and, and so forth. But if one's um, client is in Mexico, let's say, there are ways to have either video depositions or to go uh, per, to that country to, you know, you have three days in Mexico City taking a deposition or defending a deposition and then um, looking at B visas or parole to bring the client back in for trial. I would recommend that anybody who's who's facing these issues look contact people who are already doing this and have done this. There's a lot of experience out there, but also there's a great great book called Challenges in Transnational Litigation. It's put out by Global Workers Alliance. I think it's available on their website, although don't quote me on that. Um, challenges in transnational litigation. It goes through questions like discovery in transnational cases, if your client is in the country, if your client is outside of the country, um, getting things signed, getting in touch with your clients, um, finding in sort of larger collective action or class cases, finding other class members, getting somebody in for, for trial. It's very, very useful. It was just recently updated this past year, I think, um, to talk about uh, current case law, so it's evolving. Um, one of the other things that I would I would note is so Rebecca talked about protective orders and can I jump in? Yeah, I ahead. think another thing about just on that really quick is that um, I we found that courts are really uh, open to the idea of telephone depositions too because if you're in private practice and the idea of like well I'll just go to Mexico and take <laughs> depositions and bring a court a translator and a court reporter and all that but um, I work for a legal aid organization we didn't have a lot of money and so we would do telephone depositions we tell our client to go somewhere and be on the phone we get counsel on a phone we get interpreter on a phone and then you're not expending extra things and then you you can if you um, you there the Mexican consulate and the U.S. government have been open to visas to parole people back in the country for trial, but you can use the deposition then at trial if you need to. Or um, so that just thinking about cost-effective ways, even though you have this um, transnational client, to still be able to represent them. Um, and just to mention, you know, I had said earlier, think about not asking for emotional distress damages. And part of the reason for that is that being undocumented in this country is, as people either know or can guess, very stressful. And so that can be a source of emotional distress. And so defendants have asked for and many times gotten uh, to inquire into immigration status to figure out if this isn't a separate source of distress in addition to the harm that they faced. Um, and so that can be handled by asking for garden variety emotional distress damages, which are emotional distress damages that a reasonable person would suffer. And so it's not subjective and doesn't go into your own client's particularized situations. They're less, but it's an option. There also are um, protective orders that we, as everyone, as everyone probably knows, you could say this is use, can be used only for 
trial and then you stipulate to someone's undocumented status um, and then they could use this within the course of litigation, but it would be, um, they would be in contempt of court if, they, if there was a retaliatory uh, reporting to ICE, which um, is sometimes enough to have clients be comfortable with the situation. So there's a variety of methods out there. Um, and maybe maybe we just we we kind of we have some things that we hit twice so the protections we're going to talk about in a little bit so just to go on thinking about the standards for how should immigration information come in and so there's the basic one under rule 26 about whether something is relevant to a claim um, there's also um, and then the rule of evidence if it makes something more probable both of those also have you know sort of safe safety nets for things going too far relevance is very very broad of course we know that um, but there's 26 C right that allows you to do a protective order if something is um, annoying embarrassing and oppressive um, and um, there the case law about immigration status in particular talks about the interim effect which then the um, I always see um, discovery d um, objections and disputes talking about well that that requires request is harassing or that question is harassing and harassment actually doesn't really come up in the language of the st of the the rules of the rules of evidence or civil proce um, procedure it's this annoying oppressive and so you can s say it's comes within under those but the interim effect principle for immigration status also is that this is going to have this is going to chill this person's ability to participate there's a public interest in people being able to vindicate their rights and participate in the judicial system and so um, discovery on immigration status has this interim effect of chilling their ability to do that and so that that's a way to sort of get be able to talk about the harassment issue and then you know rule um, federal rule of evidence 403 Four, 403 talks about does the probative value of it outweighed by the unfair prejudice that happens for it which often like employers can come up with a, a reason why oh I need to know this we have to talk about their employer stat employee status their immigration status because it's part of the story da, 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 da. and maybe but usually it's so minor their, their relevance argument is so minor that you can say yeah but the prejudice the unfair prejudice of this is such that it shouldn't come in so, may, so maybe we can go and talk a little bit about um, sort of tools. This gets back to some of the protections for um, yeah. risks of litigation. Do you want to and, start? And Rebecca <laughs> completely is right that I jumped the gun in terms of talking about it, protections. Um, so we've talked about a couple of them. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to mention is the idea of bifurcation and this goes to the question of what remedies are available and so if you're worried about um, about undocumented status coming out in a trial on liability you can ask the court to bifurcate damages so that that question of discovery into immigration status and the, the availability of various remedies comes up in a separate proceeding um, and and you can ask the court to be the one to be the fact finder and perhaps you can work that out with the defendants and um, and it goes to this question of knowing your form knowing whether you're more likely to have um, a fair hearing before a fair fact finder if you go to the community and the jurors or if you're in front of a, a judge um, who's uh, who might have a different view and so it's a I would say it's a um, it, it's very context specific about knowing where you are. Yeah. I like to think about this like I don't have any fast rules in a case about like how I like to go about doing it um, because every case is different you know and I was just talking about bifurcation like one of the nice things about that is like you're putting off the issue and lots of cases settle so you might never get to the point where you have to actually this issue has to come up and you have to have an argument about it um, and so you really I think about it as like an issue that's in the back of my head and I make the decisions like a little bit here and there throughout the case about what's the best way to protect my client keep the case mo moving forward to try and uh, achieve their end goal um, and this goes back to what I mentioned before about the issue where um, 
like from a perspective as a criminal attorney where you should be thinking, what is my client pleading to something that could have collateral immigration consequences for them? I also would always think as a, an employment attorney, I don't want my client to later regret that they brought this wage case, which often is for $1,000 or less. It's not, they're not becoming millionaires about it because they had a deposition where they talked about their status or something like that, that then is affecting their ability to adjust their status later or any kind of collateral consequences from it. And so the more I can make immigration status not an issue in the case, I have, for me, and especially practicing in Georgia, has been great. And so I don't affirmative, I tend to not affirmatively go out and like pick that fight. I let things unfold and at each juncture kind of figure out what's the way we can kick this down the road, what's the way we can not get at this right now to just not even have it be part of the litigation at all. Um, a, c a couple other things that are, aren't on here, I think, is like filing cases as pseudonyms, which I don't think in Georgia would probably get that much traction, but there have been some cases in the Ninth Circuit that have allowed that. We got it. We got that on the other one. Oh, you got it here. We got it here. Oh, my God, look at that. <laughs> That's great. Um, it was in the, um, Georgia passed an anti-immigrant law, HB 87, and there was a challenge to certain provisions of that law, and certain people asked to proceed under pseudonyms. Um, it's a question under Rule 10, because it says that parties shall be named, and there it goes to the question of whether it's fair in this situation to not name the party. Um, that, because it was a civil rights case, it was against the government, it didn't really matter who the people were as long as they were standing and we were willing to have there be discovery into standing as long as it didn't give names and so forth. Um, the court granted the DOE status in that, in that litigation. It looks at questions like, um, you know, is the person a minor, is the person at risk, is there danger uh, from the community of releasing their information. I'd say that in employment litigation, it would be harder to be DOE, and one should, I've never sought to do it in employment situations, and I'm not sure one could, because you have to let the employer know whose employment records are at issue. So maybe you can prevent it from, prevent um, the name from coming out in public, but the employer at least would have a right to know under most situations that I can think of. Maybe you all have faced this and, and know of situations where you could proceed under DOE status. Yeah. Um. I think another thing is knowing your opposing counsel, because sometimes when there's an immigration issue up in a case, and knowing the employer, um, are they are they kind of vindictive and looking for opportunities to take advantage? Are they really angry about the litigation? Do they also, uh, sometimes there's a lot of like, everybody knows that there's undocumented workers. They're gonna have witnesses who are undocumented. They don't want their witnesses to talk about that. And so everybody sort of agrees without saying anything to not make a big issue of that kind of thing. So that's another time where it goes forward. Uh, with discovery issues, you know, I was saying where it's like kick it down the can. Um, when I practiced in New York, I we like affirmatively got a protective order to be like, this shouldn't come up in the case. Oh, well, I don't have a sense as uh, sort of sympathetic judges here, so I don't bring it up. So someone files discovery requests, well, first you object to it. And then you have to see, are they even going to file a motion to compel about it? There's just so many steps before it actually becomes an issue when things come up in depositions um, you know I'll say I'm gonna instruct my client not to answer that and they and I almost never ever had a time when the employer followed through to seek a motion to compel on that issue because then they have to put down like out of the context of a deposition why are, why is they why do they need this information I was thinking that's another thing that I always like to do is force people to say and tell me in writing because when you're having a discovery dispute right you have to have your good faith negotiation before you can bring a motion to compel and I'm like I want to know the reasons why you need this information and I am so happy to give you all these other things to help you achieve that goal that have nothing to do with immigration status so it make, puts them they really have to like see how is a judge going to look at this request when they're trying to be accommodating and all these other respects and what uh, the reasons that I have for needing this information aren't, um, aren't, as, aren't as strong. And I just also want to say one thing about the Fifth Amendment, um, which we don't have on this list, is something people can say, um, uh, use their Fifth Amendment rights to not answer a question. Um, my practice was to avoid that because, as we all know, there's um, an adverse inference that can be drawn from that. And like I said, where I also don't want people to regret later down the road that they had an immigration uh, employment case for $800 because now they have there's a sworn record of them having their Fifth Amendment right. Um, 
there's often not a need to go that far right away. And it's again, it's like it's a remedy that I think about as sort of being a last resort because I don't want some person to have to have done that. And it often doesn't um, doesn't uh, reach that because the employer doesn't follow through. Push, 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 push for that. And I, th I think definitely from the employer's perspective, I know when some of the employment attorneys in my firm say, I have a case that involves undocumented workers and the client is really, really pushing to um, make status a big issue in this case. And, you know, my first question always is, have they looked at what they've been doing? Um, <laughs> because when you put somebody else's status, you're also inviting inspection into your um, practices. So, um, you know, we'll ask things like, well, let's see their I-9, let's see what documents they provided when they were hired, their application form, and then we have to have a serious discussion about, well, if this comes into evidence, then what can they say about your practices? Are they going to come and say that you have 50 other undocumented workers that you know about and you did nothing about and how is that going to affect this case. So I think a lot of times um, you can get the employer to back off on that portion as well. Mm -hmm. But they do have to do a really thorough investigation of their own practices. I was just going to say that from the employer's perspective, if you, and my, my experience has been that if you ever get an I-9 in any circumstances, look at it because you'd be amazed the extent to which you will find simple errors, complex errors, and they will pervade the employer's practices. And not only is that bad from an I-9 perspective, but it will, it will very, it will prejudice, uh, you know, a jury or somebody else's view of your entire compliance profile. So if you have an overtime case or whatever, if you're not keeping good I-9s, you know, it, it gives a bad impression of your overall compliance. So every time I get one in any context, I always take a minute and look to see if it's, if it's been completed correctly or not, because you never know what else it'll show. I agree, I agree completely with you. I mean, it's one of those things that everybody thinks is very simple and everyone does it right. But I've been doing this for 17 years. I've never met an employer from a mom and pop restaurant all the way up to Fortune 500 companies that complete the I-9 right. And that's usually one of the first places the government will look because they know nobody's doing these right. Um, but that is one, one thing that, from the employer's perspective, if you want to make undocumented status an issue, you need to look at your own house first um, before you put that into litigation because that can have a lot more severe consequences and you definitely don't want to have to plead the fifth for a corporate entity. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think in the the flip of that, I know when I'm representing employees, you know, we're looking, we're, we want to tell the narrative about an employer who's not in compliance and is doing all these bad things. But the same way it can backfire for employers if you are starting to um, point, try and say like, oh, they're doing all this stuff with undocumented immigrants. You have to think about how in the end a jury or fact finder is going to be like, well, your client was working there and whether they were legal or not, if they are not, um, you know, that they don't look like me, like they might start to um, make inferences about your client. And so you have to think about your narrative and how it can spill out even for, for both sides, I think. Yeah, and I think a lot of people forget that the I-9 is signed under penalty of perjury, both by the employee in Section 1 and the employer in Section 2. That's huge. I mean, to put that in front of a jury and, uh, you know, you really have to be sure that your own house is in an order um, if you're going to bring an, an employee's undocumented status up forth. Maybe I'll say one thing as we transition to this next slide, which I'm not actually supposed to talk about because these are the experts, but is that um, the article in the materials talks about like times when it could be in your advantage to reveal your client's status. And I think I've already made clear that I kind of think I never want, if I have a undocumented worker, to have any kind of record that's going to haunt them later because they wanted to get paid for all the hours that they worked. But one situation where that might happen is if it's such a compelling trafficking or um, terror situation where you can benefit from that narrative of this is a person who is very very exploited and the employer was taking advantage of them for all these reasons and because of their status but you would probably you want that to be at a place where your client is protective for example by getting a U visa <laughs> and so for the U visas this is a very good source to use um, especially if you have a victim of a qualified criminal activity and it can be a direct 
victim or somebody indirectly. So for instance, if it's the family member of um, a victim who's deceased or incapacitated, they can still apply for the U visa as well. You do have to show that they suffered severe, um, substantial physical or mental abuse. And usually it's medical reports, police reports. Um, sometimes we've used clergy affidavits um, to show that in addition to photos as well. Um, and some of the criminal activities that typically the government will give for U visas, um, involuntary servitude, especially in the agriculture area. Um, we do have to show that that person possesses information about that criminal activity and that it's helpful to the law enforcement agency in detecting that violation, investigating it, and then prosecuting it fully. Um, and it does have to be criminal activity that occurred in the U.S., not outside of the U.S. I think probably the most challenging part is getting that law enforcement <laughs> agency to sign off on it. Um, and there's, uh, there's been a lot of challenges with that, um, which I'm sure Naomi will discuss. But there's really only 10,000 of these visas available each year. Um, and the USCIS has sole discre discretion over a jurisdiction over the U visas. Um, and it does require a pretty substantial application, so it's not something we would ever recommend uh, an undocumented worker doing on their own. They should really have some help with this. It's very extensive, extensive documentation on showing the, um, the violations and the abuse. Yeah, so, uh, go ahead. I know it's, it, I mean, you can substantiate the physical abuse, but how do you collect documentation with mental abuse? You know, how do you come about that? Because if you're, you're talking about um, servitude, somebody's not talking because the person is afraid, there is no reported incidents to the police or something, how do you gather information for that particular part? you know, suff suffered substantial physical or mental abuse if there is no police record? I think you'd have to rely more on the medical professionals, um, have them evaluated by a psychologist or psychiatrist. Uh, that would be a much more difficult case, I think, obviously, than having the photographic proof of that. But um, certainly there's medical professionals who can document emotional abuse. And USCIS has faced this and, and will take a report from a counselor, psychologist, psychiatrist, social worker that talks about, you know, where the, where the person has interviewed the client and reports about what the, med what the um, mental trauma is that he or she sees. So to take a, um, a little bit of a, a context moment. I, people may already know this. The U visa is a visa that provides humanitarian relief to victims of certain crimes, as Shannon said, and it's it was created to encourage people who are from, um, who are living in the shadows basically to come forward and report crimes so that there are not pockets of criminal activity that can't be reached. Um, it provides lawful status and a non-immigrant status for up to four years. You can apply for your family members, if um, your children, your spouse, or if you're a child, your, your parents, and there are certain circumstances, um, unmarried siblings. And it provides work authorization um, for the four years of the term of the visa. So it's a pretty powerful um, uh, remedy in its own sense for, a, for somebody who's been a victim of these um, qualifying criminal activities. It, after, the, after three years, somebody can petition to become a, a lawful permanent resident if they've met certain criteria, and that's its own process. But um, one thing that I wanted to point out, you know, Shannon said that involuntary servitude is one of the qualifying criminal activities. I think there's maybe now 27. The workplace ones are you know, the uh, trafficking and voluntary servitude. Also, there's witness tampering. So if an employer came to somebody and said, don't testify or 
X bad thing will happen. That can be the basis. There's obstruction of justice, sexual assault, fraud in foreign labor contracting is a new one um, that was passed, I think, in the 2012 Vo uh, Violence Against Women Act reauthorization. And there are also equivalent state crimes. Um, they tend to be major crimes um, because uh, this is a limited remedy. Um, there are, I totally agree with Shannon that the hardest thing is getting the law enforcement certification, um, but it's, it's a mandatory part of the application. I would say that there are a variety of law enforcement agencies, some of whom are not the ones that immediately spring to my mind. So in addition to the police and immigration and customs enforcement, there's also the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission that can certify U visas. They'll typically only do so if they're planning to bring a case themselves for employment discrimination, but they are a law enforcement agency to whom you can report and ask for a U visa, and we've been successful with that. The Department of Labor will certify U visas for certain workplace crimes, um, and if you, there's a U visa certifier um, in each, or a U visa certification officer in each DOL region, and so you could become familiar with who the, that person is in this region. Um, I will say that DOL is considering expanding out some of its, uh, what it will certify for, and, and also considering uh, certifying for T visas, which are trafficking visas, the whole separate issue. Um, I would say that, again, there are some really great resources out there. I would suggest people to go to Asista's U Visa Clearinghouse if one has U Visa clients coming to you. That's A S I S T A. And if you just type in Asista U Visa Clearinghouse, you'll come upon a wealth of information that's been. Um, uh, gathered there. There are also a number of people uh, here locally doing these kinds of visas, so there's, um, there are people to talk to. Um, anything else? No, I think we've covered it. Okay. Yeah. Should, should, so, so, and just to tie that in, of course, if somebody has a U visa, they might be less concerned about their status coming in, or it's just a different consideration. And so, anyway, maybe we could talk about the end of the case situation. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but just it's just another t thing to flag with um, when you are representing someone who's undocumented with settlement considerations. There's been a lot more focus on um, tax reporting with litigation. Um, settlements and um, employment settlements about making sure that you know you've got because it's it's wages right and so there's that issue and so how are you going to um, what are you going how do you how you do that reporting and again it's just contextual based on what the relationship was with the employer was the person using um, a social security number or were they just working without work authorization you can use 1099s and ITINs but the um, National Employment Law Project has some handouts some sort of frequently asked questions and um, information about that. But that's something that I think is good to reach out to other practitioners and see what they've done in different situations in terms of how you structure what you call the settlement money and how you handle um, the work, um, the tax reporting and um, at, the end, at the end of the case and who's responsible for it. Um, and then I, I just think there's some other um, issues, like um, I represented a lot of guest workers, and um, th thinking creatively about non-monetary remedies that can assist people. So um, I had clients who then were in and out of status because they had visas that expired. I represent agricultural workers, so you get a seasonal visa, and then it um, expires. And so we uh, technically, you know, if somebody was undocumented at the time they had their case going on, that employer has been participating in the H-2A program and getting guest worker visas. So we would do rehire agreements where you're going to we, you, um, include this person in your labor certification and bring them back legally. And so even though it's sort of a way around the um, limitation of Hoffman Plastics to sort of f get someone that relief. And that's really powerful with retaliation issues because you want that person, you want people to not be afraid of speaking up for losing this very important resource for their families and um, to come back. So we um, worked on that a lot. Anything else about settlement? So we discussed a lot about the ethical considerations when we were dealing with undocumented workers, but one part we haven't discussed so much is 
for nationals in the U.S. that are here on U.S. work visas, which sometimes can be just as complicated because the employer has control over their job and also their work visa and their status, and it's important for them to want to maintain their status. Um, so that's another area that um, we want to look at. And you get unique situations with business immigration law because one of the things that we have to deal with is a lot of um, situations where we're representing both the employer and the employee. So you have a dual representation situation and there's always that potential for a conflict of interest to rise and it's really important to have a very strong dual representation agreement when you're doing business immigration visas um, where you're essentially representing both the employee and the employer in the event that a conflict does arise that everybody understands what's going to happen in that situation and it's important that the both the employee and the employer sign off on that agreement. Um, I think one of the difficulties that employers have a lot of times understanding is that they are signing these petitions under penalty of perjury. So it's important that they're reading them, they understand their obligations, and that you as an attorney inform them about all of their obligations under the various work visas that they use. And usually immigration is a very small part of an HR director's or a VP of HR's job or even the general counsel. They don't touch immigration issues on a daily basis usually. So it's really important to inform them about the obligations that they're signing off on. And especially when it comes to like H-1B workers where you have to pay a prevailing wage and they have to receive the same benefits as U.S. workers. Um, a lot of times where the litigation will arise is where that's not happening. The employer is not paying the prevailing wage or is treating U.S. workers better than H-1B workers or vice versa. There's uh, pl plenty of claims of U.S. workers um, f have filed saying that H-1B workers are treated better than U.S. workers. Um, but if the H-1B employee does sue that employer, uh, it's important that you educate them about what could happen to their underlying H-1B work visa if you're representing the employee. Um, because in order to preserve their status, they really need to have, if they think they're going to lose their job, under the H-1B regulations, they should really have an H-1B transfer filed for a new employer before they lose that job. Mm -hmm. um, there are situations where the government will understand if there's a gap and you explain that there was litigation going on and they were retaliated against or something like that, where you can use that to explain their gap in status. But really under the regulations, they should be filing an H-1B transfer before they're terminated from their current employer. So it's especially important for them to understand and it's important for them to keep their status. So that would be a, an important discussion to have with them. When you're dealing with H-2A, H-2B, or when you're moving an H-1B worker to a labor certification for permanent residence in the U.S., there's very, very strict recruitment requirements for employers. And a lot of times the grief we get from our clients is, well, I don't do this when I hire a U.S. worker. Why do I have to do this now? Um, so especially in the IT field, you know, most, most IT companies will just post a job on their website and they don't ever have to do any other recruitment because they're able to find people. Um, or every other site in the world picks it up and it's, it's out there for everybody. But they don't understand that, for instance, if you're moving an H-1B worker to a permanent labor certification, you have to do two print ads in the AJC. I mean, that's ridiculous. The IT people are like, we don't use the AJC <laughs> to advertise. So there's very stringent requirements that they have to meet. And um, explaining that to them sometimes can get very difficult, but it's, it's important because the U.S. workers have to be properly vetted. Um, in those situations, you do have to show that there's no qualified U.S. worker for that job. And uh, you, know, you have to be very vigilant about making sure the employers vetting all the resumes that are coming in against the requirements for that position. Um, because ultimately, they're signing off on that application saying that there is no qualified U.S. worker to fill this job. So you have to make sure that they've followed all the procedures and all the recruitment um, in order to make sure that they can get that worker that they want. Um, but it can't be to the detriment of the U.S. workers.
I think maybe one last thing is uh, that just like if you are representing a, a someone who has a contingent like work visa like a H-1B or H-2A, um, just making sure it's your you understand how the program works and you're able to counsel them about what they might want to do about retaliation and i know in um, my cases with seasonal workers that we we immediately when you're starting to bring litigation you're just predicting that there'll be retaliation and you want to put yourself in the best situation to document it and prove it and protect your client so that maybe you can even avoid it but you have to understand the program and the and how that employer participates in the program so that you're able to do that and it really requires often your client's participation and understanding and making sure they're keeping track of phone calls and communications and that things to um, make sure that doesn't harm them. And if I could just say one thing to underscore what Shannon says about it's having a dual representation agreement, I, um, I don't, I represent employees, but um, but it's, uh, if I ever am in a situation where I'm an immigration lawyer representing both the employee and employer, I will absolutely have a dual representation agreement because I um, am currently suing a lawyer who didn't have one <laughs> and told his employer client one thing and his employee clients another thing. So obviously the problems run deeper than not having an agreement. But, <laughs> but now he's being sued by the employees and the employer. And so just you know think about that situation. <laughs> not that anybody in this room would have that problem, but <laughs> he just didn't think through the conflicts of interests very deeply. And there's certain applications that the employer has to pay for. Um, for most situations, the H-1B, the employer will pay for, and usually the worker doesn't want the expense of having their own attorney, so they'll trust you that you're going to watch out for their interests, and as long as you make it clear that you know, I'm not your friend and you calling me and telling me not to tell the employer something is not going to happen. <laughs> as long as both parties understand that whatever information is provided is going to be shared equally and if a conflict arises that um, we'll have to deal with that situation and obtain separate counsel at that point. Um, but having that dual representation agreement is, is essential in this practice, I think. And one last conflict that I think could come up, even if you're only representing employees at a work site, if you're representing both U.S. workers <coughs> and foreign workers, they sometimes have different interests because of the labor certification process and that. And so it's just another thing. Sometimes employers are big enough where their conflicts won't actually come to a head, but being really aware of those and um, making sure you're disclosing that and discussing it with your clients and making your litigation decisions based on that is really important. So I think we're at the point where we want to know whether you all have questions um, and or have you had situations that you think that um, you know we didn't we didn't touch on that uh, that should be discussed or shared amongst the group. Um, yeah, that's. If you're that's, very that's, hungry, <laughs> 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 worried that all the turkey sandwiches will disappear before we get downstairs. <laughs> well. Thank you for Thank listening you. and yeah, sharing. I appreciate it. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.